Studio 102 in Plymouth Barbican. 102 Boxall Street, the Barbican, Plymouth Peel 1, 2DD. It's the end of the year show. With Standout Heart. So this is the artwork of Gypsy Watkins and she's a singer and photographer. So what's this piece of rap? She, and she doesn't want to be on camera, so she's going to be talking about her art. So what's this about Gypsy? Um, it's about alcoholism and the impact it has on society. Yeah. So uh, this piece of work was um, an installation and it was mixed media and it's very personal to me. Um, and within this piece of work there's beauty within the beauty. So the illness of alcoholism. Yes. Um, there's also beauty within that illness because when um, a person... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's struggling with alcoholism. Yes. Um, they become um, happy when they don't drink, but they struggle. So yeah. I think that. Uh, it's a downfall of lots of people, isn't it? Well, I wanted to highlight it. Um, and the, every, every two which is made out of the social side of alcohol, and in the UK. The UK is one of the countries that you don't fit in if you're not a drinker. It is. And I was also um, highlighting um, my personal um, experience because there's a hat here on the chair and I had to chew um, 300 pieces of chewing gum yeah. um, to stick on this chair because I used to sing um, uh, on, on the street and I used to sit on this chair when I was pregnant when I used to sing. And um, I purposely chose the chewing gum um, to eat because alcoholics hide the breath with chewing gum. So I, I wanted to hide, um, I wanted to present that in this and also with the um, the um, it's very thematic so this project was built by uh, recycled um, objects so the wood was recycled and the netting was recycled so it was about objects found on the beach um, so it's about finding that peace and tranquility there's also some driftwood here and the driftwood is being to represent the drifting in and out of that illness and that psychological effect that it has um, on many people within the UK and beyond and then I um, placed the shadows on the wall which was actually um, I didn't really do that on purpose it just happened but what I did was I used professional stage lighting where my stage my, my, my experience of being on the stage I use these spotlights to um, direct um, onto the objects and then magic happened and the lighting um, helped the shadows to uh, be highlighted and so this is beauty within the trapless of the box of alcoholism because it is quite um, it's a, an illness that is destructive, yeah. um, but then there's beauty around that. So it's sort of like there's beauty beyond that. It is lovely. I, I do, um, that's where I um, found my passion in uh, macro photography. Yes. So my work is predominantly photography. So how long have you been doing macro photography? Um, I've been working with photography now for nearly two years, which my uh, other people. Really? I've seen each other for a while. I'm always jumping up in the chair. Yeah. What's this about then? Um, this is about empowerment and vulnerability within women and also it is um, to highlight the, highlight the impact of vulnerability yeah. um, on women and uh, female women should be strong. It's also questioning gender and sexuality yes. um, and how, how the um, sort of, um, masculinity um, when in clothing can cover um, or be who you are, uh, so sort of question what is empowerment. So I've used a lot of um, connotations within this image. Yes. Um, what I've done is I've taken um, sort of question marks away. So here, there might be a question mark here. So I'm asking about is a person vulnerable, is a person powerful, um, are they empowered? Um, I'm asking the audience really, um, what makes you vulnerable and how can you be more empowered because a lot of people lack a lot of confidence in life and I think that it's important to highlight that people should be feeling empowered yeah. and confident within themselves no matter what. I also wanted to question my own sort of um, personal preference on vulnerability and gender and I wanted to create two contrasting images um, in the human form. Yeah, I'm, and also quite vulnerable in sort of like a life model form, but then I would feel really, really confident in that sort of persona. It's a caliber of a folk image in media represent quite empowerment, I, I, I believe. Um, so it's really a contrast, it's basically um, photography, self-portraiture, and it's reflecting um, back to uh, life drawing lessons that I 
did at um, university and how, how would I feel when I draw um, the human form. And also uh, I got on Photoshop and edited uh, yeah. the text out, uh, which uh, um, text is predominantly based on my media knowledge now. Yeah. Uh, is also sort of quite an empowering thing to do. Thanks a lot. Well, you alright, Jack? Yeah, not too bad. Course. You haven't got your uh, rat earrings in today. No, no, no mouse earrings, but I've got some earrings. rat pencil cases. Oh, yeah, this is your zipper. Yeah, so I've got a uh, bummy zipper. So how, you're getting tremendous feedback on Facebook actually from all over the world. Yeah, it's been in a couple of newspapers as well, man. It's sick, <laughs> buzzing. Well, Once you got that, oh, you got this and all. Yeah, what paper? It's a big deal. It is. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge kind of snail. Uh, you dirty rat. So how much are these? 40 quid each. Crumbs. Plus postage. And how long does it take to make them? Uh, about three days all in all. Yeah. Drying time and that skin and drying and stuffing. About three days. So this guy is going to be close for a while, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Are yeah, they're not doing an exhibition for a while. Yeah, yeah, they'll be working, yeah. So how much work are you producing at the moment? I've uh, got loads of orders for pencil cases. A lot of orders for mouse earrings have just started coming in. Yeah. Uh, did me little logos with the hearts and balls of mice as well, they're being popular for Christmas. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's about are it. Are you really. doing Christmas orders, though? Well, excuse me, people are ordering stuff for Christmas presents at the minute, so yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, I've just been necking beer, innit? <laughs> so that's, that's like the first thing I'm trying to sort out is everything everyone wants now, so I can start playing. you've enjoyed your food. Yeah, well, I've enjoyed my lager, anyway. <laughs> the, um, I wanted, I'm trying to turn an automatic air freshener into a rabbit, or a rabbit into an automatic air freshener. Uh -huh. So out of its mouth is going to come a dispersion of uh, <laughs> spray. Okay. Uh, so when do you have, to have that thing? Probably in the next few weeks. Yeah. Cause I'm, just because I'm making a shit ton of these at the minute. So. Yeah. Will the other one be going on Facebook? Yeah, yeah, I'll be popping it on my Facebook and Instagram page and that. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's been getting lots of likes anyway, and like you said, Facebook. Yeah, well, people are, I love seeing what people say about it, innit? Like, obviously, it's not nice when people are going, ah, oh, you're mental, but, you know, a lot of people find it funny, so that's pretty sound. I quite like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, thanks a lot, Jack, anyway. No worries, bro. What's your name? Hi, my name's Chris Parks. Nice name, Chris. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, what's your work about in this gallery? Um, it's a collection of portraits from my travels and my work with humanitarian organisations. Yeah. Um, and the, I say the gist of my work is to try and bring people into a space where they want to engage with the person they're looking at rather than exoticizing them too much or turning them into victims trying to avoid some of the narratives I've seen growing up around um, humanitarian work and how people tend to treat people from especially from um, the African continent um, so it's, that sort of involves you know going into people talking to them um, interviewing them and then using that information to try and build an image yeah. which would really and then using color contrast composition to sort of really grab people's attention by the throat yeah. a little bit and um, try and get them to engage a little more beyond just the superficial so how did you get into humanitarian work? Um, I've always had an interest, I mean, when I was, my first interest in photography was, uh, one of my big heroes was Don McCullen, and, um, and he is a wolf, one of the great wolf photographers, um, and living wolf photographers as well. He's lives in Somerset now, I think, um, but his work, I was really touched by the, how he, his work was of people in extreme distress or have suffered, you know, major trauma, uh, or in uh, surviving conflict or in conflict and he always managed to keep their humanity intact and their dignity intact yes. and I th that was something that I thought that was and state predominantly in black and white as well yeah absolutely um, so that was one strand I think I drew in but then I, as I got into photography it was very much from a, a, a place of 
photography was what paid my rent and obviously that meant no, I was okay. it doesn't pay my rent <laughs> well I, mean, I was very lucky I mean I, I think I had I, I was first a cruise ship photographer before anything else oh, so you're not a cruise ship photographer oh, yes of course. it was just kind of considered like the McDonald's of photography yeah well, I mean it's good one because you have, at least you are getting out and traveling at the same time yeah I mean I, that was the cool for me well. yeah and you get to you get to save a lot of money you get to learn how to um, run photography as a business you get to how to engage with people, how to get people on your side very, very quickly, even though they might not like you, yes. um, and how to, yeah, very much, and I think that stood me in good stead when I came to London, I started working more and sort of um, eventually working with corporations and working with wedding clients, predominantly for a long, long time. Yes. In 2016, there's always a sense that this didn't have quite the meaning I wanted it to, not the meaning I'd grown up with in mind the work like the heroes I had. Yes. And, um, I eventually, one of my clients asked me to come on board as an employee and I was like, this makes a lot of sense because everything was going just too fast at the time and I needed something more sustainable. And I was like, oh, I would really like to look around. This is a great opportunity for you to look around and to look for a charity. And as it turned out, a client of mine was like, come, come here, you've got to meet this charity I'm working for. They're amazing. Blah, blah, blah. And I ended up going to Sierra Leone in 2016. They have a, this charity has a marathon there every year. Yes. And that was just turned everything upside down for me as like this is like this is you what I've been it was a break it was, it was, it was this breakthrough in my mind yes. and it was also experience also experiencing seeing there's one thing reading about poverty there's one thing seeing poverty on the TV it's very different sitting with someone and hearing how it affects them as a human being and then not being able to take that home with you yeah. and it's not feeling a sense of responsibility in some sense that person shouldn't be ignored and that person deserves to be helped and their story should be told yeah. and uh, that, that was like this is a skill set I can definitely bring together so from that point onwards it's sort of been accelerating into that space and yeah. slowly trying to build a new name for myself there because you can't just walk in and go oh hey I've been doing it for 20 years hi me and they're like we yeah. have 20 other people doing the same job already. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's well, kind of... It's, 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 it's exhausted, so you've got to be specialising in what you're, where your soul is, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it, and very much having... I think uh, my work seems to be leaning towards West Africa at the moment, and possibly one of my last trips to Sierra Leone was just a week ago, possibly focusing on in the medical space, yes. um, and the huge impact that medical humanitarian work has on people's lives so there. So what's the difference... Um, in reality to what you see on the news? I think the news, it tends to, it tends to simplify people's stories. It tends to break it down to like, this is the problem, yeah. rather than this is a person who grew up here, this is a childhood, had interests, has ambitions, has, um, has a humanity of their own, has a sense of humor, um, has an opinion on things. Um, has um, so, and that was always that complexity was always missing for me from news reports. And I don't want to take away from it because the news, you know, that's a first step for some people getting involved. Yes. But it's so fast now, and you can't sit and take and really get to know someone. And I think what I'm trying to do is transfer some of my own experience to other people. It's like. I can't just ignore this human being. I can't just dismiss it as a piece of news. Yeah. It's actually someone's story and we have a personal responsibility to help each other. Yeah. And that's kind of the value I'm trying to bring through in my own work and hopefully, even on a small level, just transmit to other people. So what made you, uh, going back to the beginning, what made you get, uh, to do, uh, go into humanitarian now? I think it's because it's the fundamental. It's, it's the fact you're on the ground with people helping them. You're not removed from them. You're actually in the field. You're in the villages, in their homes, understanding the day-to-day -day life, the challenges, seeing how this doesn't work because that doesn't work, that doesn't work because this doesn't work, and getting all the pieces together, and then connecting people, and then it's the sense of connection with those people on the ground, which is so much more immediate because you just can't get from being removed from it. You have to go in and kind of get involved in their lives a little way. And there's a, you have to be very careful going in as a white person. I think there's a huge risk of a white colonial imperialist context. And places in Africa and yeah. Sierra Leone, yeah, I mean, Sierra Leone obviously was like, you know, a lot of it is because it's called Freetown because they, a lot of the slaves were freed into their area. Um, and you can also see parts of Africa where this is a new, the China's coming in now and there's that new thing has started up. It's like, well, we'll take, we're going to give you a bridge, which you really need, but then we're going to take your emerald mines for a hundred years. Or we're going to do this, but we're also going to like 
clean out your fishing stocks. It's a local fisherman, uh, and there's no navy to patrol the waters to regulate the waters. And uh, so there's this massively complicated political narratives and cultural narratives going on. And say so, like getting stuck in with it really and trying to just make minute little difference on your own, and then collectively trying to make large differences and trying to keep those people's identities intact, respect them as human beings, respecting their agency, respecting their opinions. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So what work have you got here? This is um, a book. I was thinking that when I was asked to the, uh, apply for the exhibition, um, I was struggling to think because there was a limited space and I wanted to, to have an impact and then there was a, uh, this, so, and also it was cost effective as a feminist as well. It's about how do I, and I love narratives, I, I think building narratives is more powerful than a single image. You start putting multiple images together, it's, it starts to form a kaleidoscope more and people start to get a sense of this is what it looks like, to, this is the heat of the place, this is the look of the place, the colours of the place, the feel of the place, the feel of the people. And I thought like how do I take the last few years and try and make that make sense to someone. So I made a book instead. And that, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, of course. So, um, actually, here. This is in Myanmar. Um, so, it's trying to. Tremendous photos. Thank you very much. Um, trying, no, trying my best. National Geographic stuff. Mate, oh, I wonder if I'm lucky. That's, that was the dream. That's always the dream. But I think I realised you need a degree for them, and I think it's going to. But then some photographers only start working in their 50s, so there's still time. Um, there's, there's still time. So what's the camera you use? Um, I've been a Nikon user. I kind of slightly romanticised by Don McCullen's F2 taking a bullet. But I started working, um, when I started working at cruise ships, we were given Nikon FM2s. I really love how rugged they were built. And, that's something that, um, and I love the fact that you can buy a lens and then 10 years later it's still able to match the latest camera. And there's something about the legacy. And, and I started in film photography. And keeps me connected to those ideals somehow. Um, I think as I've gone sort of traveling more, I start to think maybe about downsizing a little bit because weight becomes a cost issue, it becomes a practical issue. Yeah. Um, and then you know, more and more powerful technology is getting built into smaller and smaller bodies. Uh -huh. So at some point I want to evolve, but I'm not in a rush. Um, uh, this is this little boy called Sachem. Um, when he was born, um, he, I think as I understood it, he wasn't breathing for the first four minutes when he came out of the womb. And it was around the age of three that noticed he wasn't walking properly. And this is um, a very small NGO in Nepal, in the southern part called Chirai, which is not how most people picture it in Nepal. It's much more like India. It's very hot, it's very dusty, it's very flat. Um, and the, t the population looks more traditionally Indian. Um, but this very small charity works with people with disabilities and they're basically they're helping him, A, he's bringing his legs, these splints here, and then teaching him how to walk one by bit. So it's really cute. This is his uncle because his dad was running the shop that day. So he carries such him to the unit and they teach him how to walk. Yeah. And he was just like, an incredibly shy kid, but the moment he turned the camera on, he just lit up like a little firework. He was wonderful. Yeah. So, um, this, these are the portraits of. Still in portraits. Uh, this is the Misaha community. Um, after the Rohingya, which I think obviously is for terrible reasons, it's been better publicized. Yeah. But um, they are one of the most marginalized um, ethnic groups in the world. They are our rank the bottom for every single development index. There is not a single girl of the age of 10 in any school anywhere in the world from this community. And they're widely considered to be untouchable because historically they were the people who washed the dead. And they also caught rats as well for rich people. So you didn't want to have anything to do with them. So you and get Welsh disease from rats as well. So you get all sorts of disease. disease. Um, yeah, it's more the social stigma that's come out of that that's, that's stuck with them. Nobody wants to do work with them. Their kids won't go to school. They're not allowed to cross land to go to school because yeah. they don't want the Musahar on their land so it's a and very luckily street child the, the the charity we work with finally got funding approval and for the next at least five years they're gonna have projects which can help improve like gender equality this huge gender disparity in the communities um, giving access to education um, sanitation education things that are going to make small but basic differences in their lives um, very and it's very interesting because like, the woman the men are traditionally the power holders in the community. It's the women who are doing the the, um, the changes, uh -huh. and I think it was them I was drawn to in the community most. The day I got to spend with them, yeah. it's really hard because it's not hard. It's challenging because you the interview got there and they were 
pissed off, pardon my French, about seeing us. Like, why are you guys back here? You take our photo, you don't care about us, you make money out of the photo. And we're like, whoa, 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 like, slow down. Like, yeah, so let's, 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 let's hear this out. Like, what are your concerns? And it's also, it has to be translated from English to Nepali to the local dialect, and then back again. So it's answer, reply. So it's yeah, so it's a long process, but it's about being patient and hearing people out and just legitimizing and validating it. Anyway, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. If you're going to take someone's photo, you can't just go in and, and there's a real risk of taking away their dignity. Um, in some communities, that's what I think is very much. I felt like it's just making a pro quick buck out of it, and I yeah. thought that's not what we're here for. Like, we need to tell your story, and where we come from, yeah. photos are really powerful for that. Yeah. So, with your consent, and once we talk to their process for an hour, yeah. things calmed down, and then they were like much more amenable to the process. And then again, talking through before we left, have you got any questions? Have you got any concerns? Seeing and showing the photo to them, and taking them through that process. Yeah. And then I've got to thank. Like, I was very lucky, I've got amazing field workers who go with me, they have ties to the community, can do the translations, and have those values as well. So it's been surrounded by people who want to be part of that kind of storytelling as well. Like, not a, and they tend to be locals, which is a huge benefit, you know? It means you, it means you, you can go in knowing that you're gonna be guided to the right place. Even you, know, you might not have the full, you can never fully understand what it's like to live like these people. But you can build a degree of empathy with them. So, how long have you been like on the humanitarian side now? It's only been a couple of years, man, but it's been like, it's changed everything. Um, so, uh, for, for, uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm hugely grateful. And uh, make sure you respect humans a lot more. What's that, sorry? Make sure you respect humans a lot more. Oh, massive. I, I think there's, I think what's hard, I think you notice some people's eyes when they talk to them. Too many people are too many boundaries. Yes. And it's very tight in the way they do it. Yeah, and I think I can understand people do that. I can understand why people have boundaries. It's hard to look at this because if you care about people, you want to do something about it. And the problems are massive. They are huge problems. But if you, that's why I think charity is so important. And good charities are so important. Good work. That, and it's not every charity. Um, sometimes which you deserve. Yeah, I think there's some charities that go in and they just, it's just about imposing a whole bunch of ideals and um, this is going to fix you rather than really understanding local problems and coming up with local solutions that are tailored to their it's exactly what it's like, and you can see the legacy of those problems in Africa now, like how embedded religion is and people's beliefs, and how difficult those are to change, and how they become barriers to positive change. And and but then at the same time, you say you have to have empathy, and you have to have respect, whether you agree with those beliefs or not. They're part of those people's identity, and they're part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and at the same time, you're trying to say, right, well, this is a possible solution for you but how is this going to work for you yeah. and it can be a very long just conversation but you've just got to keep it's a process of erosion yeah. I say it doesn't happen it's not fast change it's small slow gradual change and you're also often dealing with systems which you know Sierra Leone is a good example where it's just massively corrupt and people have lost faith in systems around them and you they have no reason to country's got a level of corruption in the UK oh yeah I, there are degrees though I'd say and now you could say like half you know, if a half your transfer budget can't be accounted for. It depends where the, where, where the corruption is as well. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not the humanitarian side. No, no, I wouldn't say that. It tends to happen more in the, on the left side of local government in some countries. And that is heartbreaking because these people often come from local, local stars themselves, come to the system, can't become corrupt. And I don't want to go into too much about it because I don't necessarily believe people are bad. I just think that they, can't, they want to look after their own. And you lose sense of the bigger picture that there's actually you've got to be able to compromise and give up some of what you want in order to have everybody flourish. Yeah. Sure, man. And this is working with um, human trafficking on the Nepal and Indian border. And this is just peer family members who've never come back from work. These are farm work, brick workers in Nepal, farm workers in Nepal. This is more in the north now. You can see it's more like sort of the Tibetan influence on the middle. And these tend to be migrant workers in India. They come up for the month, out of the month, season, season, work for six months. They go home, so they build them a school. So the kids don't run around and have no to go. As uh, fishing, fishermen's coming in from Sierra Leone. This is a beautiful story. This is uh, these three women had one husband, 
and they lost their husband to Ebola and their oldest sons. They lost the two primary caregivers um, and the work that street child involved and enabled them to build their own garden and um, have their own flourishing business which means they can support their 18 children now as well. Um, and again, just people have been through so much and like, just deal with it very matter of factly with great dignity. I was working with school girls in Sierra Leone, it's you know, massive uh, challenges that girls have in education. Girls often have to sleep with teachers for their grades. They usually drop out around the age of 14 because they become pregnant or it's expected they're going to come home and become their wives. Um, she was an incredible girl, her name's Emma. Um, she became pregnant when she was 14, my co-worker. She's trying to save up, she go back to school. And she just sort of had to go home with her mom. Her mom was like, I'm not going to fund your education because you have to live with your dad. And so she had to do it, fund her own education on her own and then became like the class captain and her mum was like now you're doing so well I want to support you and it's oh yeah and it was like oh no they, 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 the Syrians are tough as nails they're <laughs> very resilient bunch of people and the women like although they don't have that they're not cowed in any way I mean, I don't, I mean in my experience they spirited direct people and it's very refreshing Refreshing to be in that environment as when British are much more polite and indirect, you know, and there's something to be said for that too. But it means you can have very honest conversations with them, and I really enjoy that. I really enjoy that process. And you come away like there each one's a memory for me as well. Um, and there's, I, mean, I could go on for ages and ages about it. There's a story behind every of these photos. Great compositions. Thank you, mate. I'm very, I'm very, big, I'm very proud of my compositions. A beautiful girl. So I need something about six years old. These are ocular albinism. Um, I use a lot of flash in my work because I want people to pop. Yeah, it pop, pops out a lot more. Um, but her eyes are just so striking. Um, I introduced her by Street Child, and she's part of 18 dependents living in one house. Um, her mom had mental health problems, so this woman had taken her in under her wing. Was looking on her own after 18 people. So, um, and it's just a very striking example of that. Yeah. Striking um, photos. This, this is actually, I think we're going to fit some really we, um, we actually lost him last week. He's only 22. Um, during the Civil War in Sierra Leone, they, um, as a, to the last couple of years of the war, they, as a message to the government, they didn't want to have the elections held, so the rebels started amputating people's limbs en masse. And this affected thousands and thousands of people. Um, and he was six years old when they took his leg. Um, and out of those communities, out of those amputated communities, have grown these football teams. Was, um, so they did, they call an exhibition match at the, at the marathon. And I was just stunned. Like it's 30 degrees on average in Sierra Leone on any given day. Humidity is suffocating, and these guys are going at running speed on their crutches playing football. I was just, I was like, I started googling. I was like, there are no. I haven't seen any images of some of these guys dressed this, and I know I could because I'd shot fitness people before, and I wanted to bring that aesthetic and dynamic into their space. I thought these for me are guys worthy of Nike campaigns. Like that's how amazing they are, um, and they're constantly they continue to have very hard lives they're not widely considered employable despite their ability and so we st last year stayed in touch with them unfortunately last time we came back to see Bala his name is Bala Telly um, he had a contract to hepatitis B and had it for some time and he damaged his liver to the point to become terminal and we tried to save him but he passed away in two days of coming back and um, it, was, it was heartbreaking heartbreaking hard experience no, it was just um, and I'm, I'm I've had a story today I'll tell you that oh and it's just very hard for people to understand like it can go through everything's fine one minute to life and death the next because the access to healthcare and, and the money to, the money to, go to get the chance for hospitals in there sometimes you know it's just not available and I can't I can't leave those people on their own to fend for themselves I just think that's wrong I don't think it's a change that's going to fix itself it needs people to go in and help them it doesn't mean you're going to do it for them I think I don't agree with that but in enabling empowering them and hopefully my images are empowering and enabling as well educating them into helping themselves absolutely yeah that's kind of where you want to go with it ultimately it's to give them a place that don't depend on you anymore and their own people yeah I put my book back it's alright <laughs> hello this is my uncle by the way he's an amazing sound engineer maybe I'm foolish maybe I'm blind thinking I can see through you play.
He's a sort of um, a sort of red book of my own. You know, he, he wrote it um, as a way of combating a, um, a creative illness that he was suffering at the time by um, accessing um, parts of the, the unconscious um, through dream and imagination and um, suppression of subconscious thought. Um, and I make work sort of based on my own sort of uh, dream life. Well, where are you from? Um, sort of from Manchester. I'm from, I'm from the Manchester area. Are you? Well. Okay. Sorry? Middlewich. Middlewich, okay. Yeah. Right. I grew up in, in South Manchester. So what was turned down to play? Um, well, just different life experiences. I mean, I just um, ended up, I was living in Sussex, I had to move somewhere, so I wanted to go somewhere where there were good schools for my kids and a uh, good art school for me, so <laughs> this is where I ended up, and it's beautiful, so uh, an ideal place to live, really. Sorry? Uh, I do, yeah, it's um, uh, jennyridgeway.uk. Sorry? Facebook? Facebook, yes. Uh, also, Jenny Ridgeway, I think. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe I'm foolish, maybe I'm blind. Thinking I can see through this, see what's beyond. No way to prove it, so maybe I'm lying. you blame on me Take a look in the mirror What do you see? Do you see it clearer? What are you to see? And what you believe Cause I'm only human after all I'm only human after all Don't put your blame on me Don't put your blame on me Thanks to the great Studio 102 in Plymouth Barbican. You can find them on Google and Facebook. Thanks to Gypsy Watkins, Jack Devaney, Chris Parks and Jenny Ridgway. This has been a Chris Summerfield Video 2018. Don't forget to subscribe to my videos. You can contact me at ccsphoto12 at hotmail.com and if you can help to sponsor my videos, you can pay upon me at ccsphoto1 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching the video. Music with great thanks by Steve Sampson from Plymouth. You can find him on Facebook. It's, 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 it's,